everyone. Thank you for coming to our second AMA. This is with Centrifuge and Tin Lake. Same difference, but well, sort of. We'll get to that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jerry from the Content Production Core Unit here with MakerDAO. And we have Will Reamer as well with us. He'll be joining in as well. And then if you guys would like to go ahead and introduce yourselves, a little bit of background on how you all got here and what you do specifically. Should I maybe start? Okay. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks, Jerry, and James. thanks for organizing. Um, so here on the Center Beach team is me, Leia. I am part of the BizDev team, and then our two uh, founders, uh, Martin and Lucas. Maybe they can say a bit about themselves later on. Um, maybe I start really briefly on, for those who are not so familiar with Centrifuge and Tin Lake, um, to give a short intro and then we can dive into how we started working with Maker. And then I've heard up front that there's especially some interest on like how our infrastructure works. So we can, we can go, depending on the questions posed to you, we can go as technical as the audience wants. Um, so probably in one sentence, Centrifuge um, is an infrastructure that allows on-chain borrowing against real-world assets. And if you use a few more words than just one sentence, um, you can basically describe it as um, Centrifuge is, well, we've built an infrastructure that allows um, basically asset originators or funds to build, uh, to create an on-chain uh, asset fund. And, um, where you have on the one side um, the asset originator to tokenize um, their financial assets and then bundle them in our DAP called Tin Lake. And on the other side, you have um, investors that can provide liquidity to, to this um, on-chain fund. And basically, what that means, they buy a share in that underlying um, collateral pool. Um, the way it works, the attendant pool is, is usually structured in two um, first tranches. We have the senior tranche, the, which is represented by the drop token, and the junior tranche, which is represented by the tin token. And um, um, yeah, so what else? We work with um, different types of asset originators. So we work with um, New Silver that I think most of you are familiar with. So finances, real world, um, real estate, um, fix and flips. We also work with um, companies that do trade finance, um, music royalties, um, et cetera. And um, we also have, or we work with different types of investors or like different types of investors can provide liquidity to a pool. So um, we have um, retail investors increasingly also um, institutional investors, but we also, the way Tin Lake is set up is that it's compatible with other DeFi protocols as well. So, and if you think of DeFi protocol, you probably think of Maker. So um, we have built an infrastructure that different types of asset originators can use to truly tap into um, DeFi liquidity. And that's more or less the segue into how we how we all ended here in this call. Um, so a couple of months ago, we onboarded our first um, partner that we worked with, which is New Silver. So um, they were the first ones to mint real world asset backed DAI. And so that was a couple of months ago, but actually the work started way, way before, um, a couple of years ago, actually, that was, when we still had Sai instead of multi-collateral Sai. Um, I think maybe Lucas can also share a little bit later, but like actually first brainstorms, I think happened in 2018 with the Dep Hub team. We had um, small pilots where we financed small transactions. That was actually with, um, with Greg and the Maker Foundation and sort of evolved that process. How can we actually um, make that work? How can we, make um, DeFi truly accessible to real world use cases, to businesses. And um, 
then 2019, um, MCD launched, and with that, the entire MIP processes and like the onboarding process for collateral specifically as well. And when that launched, it was very, it was clearly coined to crypto native assets. So that was like when we started formalizing, or like started like truly work on okay, how can we formalize that process that we can make that we can find a way that actually real world assets can be onboarded in a scalable way and also replicable way um, to expand, like to broaden the collateral portfolio of, of MakerDAO as well and add uncorrelated um, assets to that portfolio. And throughout that process, Will and also Sepp arrived at the horizon and later joined by Phil. So then the Real World Finance Core unit was um, was formed and um, we had, I think I can't even count the number of community calls and risk meetings and forum posts. Um, but this this basically ended us, um, made us end up here where we're now, as I said, um, on board at New Silver, there are four more asset originators that we partner with um, that are waiting for the executive vote um, really soon. And we have a few more asset originators in different stages of the governance process. And also maybe saying along this process, and um, as I've described, this onboarding process has been an iterative approach. It has it has been long, long in the making, and also, well, it's just saying more than fifty calls for sure. I would probably say probably more than hundred calls. Um, but like also, exactly what the last two weeks have shown, so that um, maybe some of you have followed the conversations going on in the forums. So, um, even though we we onboarded New Server now and it's been like with the Centrifuge model that that we have, um, it will be continuously adapted and improved. And um, yeah, we're really excited to scale real world assets in, in MCD with everyone. I think this is a real, in really short. I don't know if um, Martin and Lucas want to add something or we want to start with questions or, or Will wants to say something. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll just, thanks for the overview, Leah. That was um, cool. Yeah, I just give like a bit bit of background on myself. I think you've we've gone into everything um, overall. I think yeah, it's been a really long process, and maybe like it's kind of interesting personally. Um, so I'm co-founder and CEO at Centrifuge. I've been um, very involved in the technical implementation of Tin Lake and sort of all this stuff. Maybe actually relevant for sort of my access to crypto. Um, was I really started getting into Ethereum in 2017, and one of the first projects I looked at very closely was was MakerDAO. And so I think I've been sort of a Maker community member since at least uh, very early 2018 when uh, I started attending governance calls. And so um, as like DeFi became a thing, which it was totally not at that point, right? Sort of the the vision of Serenity Future also became to like. Of, of what I was doing professionally um, uh, became more and more aligned with what Maker's doing and sort of really our idea of how do we take all of the great technology, all of the great innovation that DeFi has, and we open that up to uh, businesses that have assets that are not crypto native today. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, what I do. And, that, and uh, I'm really happy to answer any questions and keep working on this vision that I think a lot of us share um in in the maker community as well yeah maybe i say also hello good morning good evening just to you know wherever you are thanks for having me martin the other co-founder um i focus more on uh business uh token economics uh new aspects uh and uh just you know uh i think it was actually a very kind of you know lucky coincidence that when we launched centrifuge with the idea of uh Connecting businesses uh, and and remove the middleman uh, for for business to interact and and give them access to finance. That then uh, you look or 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 already at our early days, I think that Maker is a decentralized line of funding. Uh, also to to other protocols back in the day, like I think Dama, for example, if someone remembers. So. Uh, uh, and that was all before even DeFi was, was a thing. Uh, but uh, both they are always thrilled by the idea of also to decentralize access to finance and 
and that actually it doesn't matter what size of their business is located, would have access to money and funding. Awesome. Um, so kind of segueing to some of the questions, um, some of the, we got some really good responses in our new anonymous question box. And one specifically that came up a few times was how do you select these real world assets? Or do you let people come to you with them? How does how does that process work? I think most of asset originators issue as they approach and ask with ideas um, how to actually kind of spin up a pool um, and and uh, look at the assets. And uh, I think you know it's a permissionless protocol, so they couldn't do it themselves. It's just you know, as most of people in these early days, they're um, you start a little bit more centralized, I guess, uh, and. Uh, it's also, I think, important just to you know get uh, quality first. I think uh, uh, on onto the protocol and then uh, grow there, um, experiment with decentralization, uh, and then kind of how it scales. Use more and more. Also, I think token economics to decentralize more and more part of the process uh, and less rely on the central instances like even even as centrifuge as a team. You know, um, so I think uh, most of the traffic is inbound. Um, and uh, I think we do our best also to kind of uh, select what we think makes sense uh, um, and uh, make it digestible for, for you as a community. Yeah, and I think also um, the further we get along in that process and, for example, now New Silver being onboarded, it, it makes conversations a lot easier as well. There's just this huge learning process. And also, I mean, New Silver has been in that process for two years, so we also need it's a little bit of a mix of like having um also asset originators that are willing to jump through all of the soups but um yeah it's definitely an interesting ride for everyone um the follow-up for that that we also got a few different responses relating to is like what is kind of the overview of that process look like from someone who says i have these assets and i'd like to tokenize them how, how do they go about that um, yeah, I do not want to go in every detail. Most likely, you know, the, the time wouldn't be uh, would be enough really to get through that in detail. So it's really a typical due diligence process, uh, providing the material, which then later can also be reused by the Reward Financing Core Unit. Really, who is the asset originator? Uh, what are the people behind? What is the team? What is the history and the track record? How do they originate the assets themselves? What is their due diligence process? Um, and uh, then. Uh, that is the first step, you know, kind of uh, pre-checking it. Uh, what we do most likely in this process already, discussing with them how a financial structure could look like, and being versatile actually with those assets being financed. So it makes commercial sense really to do that. Uh, and uh, I think that is, is most likely something which you can do in a few days. And then from there, the in-depth vision James really kind of, you know, uh, starting there. You look at the counterparties, the borrowers, uh, the assets themselves, get an idea. Uh, is it actually also something you really want to finance? Uh, I just also kind of, you know, not just from a legal perspective or uh, the, the risk, but also the nature of the assets, you know, that is something uh, I personally or the centrifuge team would like to support or not. Um, so we also just rejected, I think, uh, a few asset originators because we didn't like the asset. I wouldn't like to, to, to get deeper here, but uh, I, I think you get it, you know. So we are actually we would like to connect our name to uh, and, and kind of support it uh, and support those as originators when they then along the process. I think finally uh, also approach you guys for for you know uh, uh, opening a vault and uh, a line of a line of credit. But it's pretty much actually the same process. I think also um, Seth and, and Bill go through um, kind of preparing that. Uh, um, kind of getting it in line and uh, kind of, you know, at least getting projects uh, uh, onto to the, to the core unit, which we believe at least are worthwhile to, to look at. Chris is asking in the chat as well, in terms of revenue, where does that generally come from in the general business model for Centrifuge? Yeah, good question. So, hey, if you're um, a blockchain project, pretty much like you guys, you know, so what you're building is an ecosystem and uh, the, the the company, Centrifuge is just, you know, a centralized starting point into that decentralized world. 
So uh, we do not want to build a traditional company with a traditional revenue model, uh, which makes profits and uh, you know where the equity gets important. Um, so we believe in in our ecosystem that we are building here. We believe in DeFi as an ecosystem and actually cope with the composability of those ecosystems, uh, and that actually you know um, the value we generate is actually helping the entire DeFi ecosystem, including you know maker others. Uh, building the different the different uh, levels uh, of uh, of the new financial system uh, and, and there it's again purely the token you know and, and um, the long term uh, um, kind of you know growth of the ecosystem and, and price appreciation of the in our case centrifuge token that's what we bet on uh, first of all and most likely as a as a company already I think uh, we look at the at the CFG holders as an as a community, of course, not as big as the, as the make as MakerDAO, but uh, of course, we go in a, in, a, in a very similar direction and share share the same goals. I think building a new financial system and uh, giving giving power to the token holders. Chris wanted to follow up and ask, how do the bills get paid specifically? Um, you you mean the bills of centrifuge? Yes. Uh, yes, hey, that is. A, Classic, you know, we have a foundation. The foundation is selling the token, uh, and uh, those proceeds will, will be used to fund uh, the centrifuge companies. Um, you know, the, the two uh, in the US and uh, in Germany, uh, as well as other interested projects and people uh, with grants, etc. And uh, I think it will more and more decentralized, but uh, a pretty much you know common funding model for for the crypto space. I think. Hey, I got a question, if you don't mind me, Jerry, jumping in. Uh, so if you guys had to, uh, if someone asked the question of what was the, uh, the mission statement of Centrifuge, do you think it would be something where the lines of you're going to help small businesses uh, have the ability to borrow DAI or any other stable coin um, to, you know, to forgo the ability to go through the banking system? Or do you think it's endless? So I'm just trying to get an idea what the mission statement is for Centrifuge. If you could just give me that. I can I can tell you what, what our mission statement is. And then I'll maybe I'll give a bit of background. But so, that, so our, our actual statement reads out, Centrifuge is unlocking economic opportunity for all by connecting people to borrow and lend money transparently and cost effectively, free of rent-seeking intermediaries and the inefficiencies of traditional finance. Um, a lot of words. Um, but maybe what what it what it means at the core is like DeFi and sort of ethereum and, and crypto is at the core of all of of these trends right is the idea that you can do create open networks without uh barriers of entries with with transparency and therefore sort of i think um benefits for everybody and uh where Sony Future, where we see this as like how we can actually provide a better experience for both borrowers and investors to um invest in these real world assets is i mean you we can create um a world where the where banks like the banks of today don't actually are the gatekeepers anymore right and similar to like how the ico um boom in 2017 sort of created a very viable alternative to listing your company publicly or trying to raise money from like traditional investor venture capital investors uh, we believe that if we can turn DeFi into this open banking system not just for um not just for people who happen to have eth or some other uh, uh token that uh but also for people all around the world that we can make their lives significantly better because um, yeah, as you mentioned, Frank, right, we can allow these smaller borrowers to access finance, access uh, banking that they might not have access to, or maybe just get access to at very inefficient rates. Oh, cool, yeah, that, that makes sense. And zooming out uh, into the future, uh, do you think that it's possible that Centrifuge, I'm sorry for the background noise, do you think it's possible that Centrifuge can pivot to a different stable coin if it had to, uh, or hypothetically another stable coin becomes more popular um is that something you guys can do is it something you ever thought about uh it's not i mean we're like it's it's something we do think about ultimately right like we, we wouldn't be serving our users if we told them to use an inferior stable coin um and so that's that's not what we would want to do 
Um, the, the idea and sort of how we think about it is like, there are these real world assets that we can help bring on chain. And then there's all these other DeFi lending protocols, um, which have need for collateral, right? Maker has a giant need for collateral right now that's uncorrelated to crypto. It, unlike any other like lending protocol that has other counterparties, so like Avi or Compound, for example, right? Maker has this benefit that they actually can mint mint die instead of having to find someone who's willing to invest. And that does give Maker a huge um, advantage. But if there is um, another stable coin that would just be needing uh, capital so much more, would be needing collateral so much more, would be willing to give better rates, right? Ultimately, of course, like you can't stop someone. And I think that is truly the like the magic of DeFi, right? It's that like uh, if rates are are a little bit lower on compound than they are on Aave right now, then it takes one block to move all of that liquidity over, um, and you suddenly um, you suddenly uh, even out the the market again. And I think sort of this extreme liquidity and this transparency is exactly actually what gives the borrowers better terms, what gives everyone using the system better terms. I think that's sort of those things are very much connected. Yeah, but I think maybe they also really thrilled it already at the beginning at the idea of Maker. Uh, uh, um, I think, you know, the only really decentralized stablecoin, which I believe really has proven that it works right now. Uh, one thing I really like with Maker is the nature of how things actually get collateralized so that, um, you know, you can have those packed stablecoins, uh, a few, I think, really seem to work and, and re reliable like USDC, but it's still packed on US dollar, you know? And uh, if you look into the future and believe in the decentralized economy in the future, I think that's not the stable coin to go for. You need a stable coin like you guys have invented, where, which is actually kind of, you know, using the economy itself, uh, doesn't matter if crypto or real world uh, as a collateral or as an opportunity opportunity collateral, and that's what I just you know like at the beginning, which is I think perfectly suited for for a decentralized financial system. Thank uh, you. Speaking about alternative stablecoins, um, you're based both in uh, in Germany and uh, the U.S. From what I understand. Uh, what's your perspective on uh, a so-called euro die? Yeah, Eurodai is again, you know, I'm not sure. Um, different, different. I think, you know, um, opinions here. Uh, I think long term, maybe you do not need any pack anymore. You know, that's most likely more that uh, Dai could be long term stabilized against the collaterals. Uh, could have an exchange rate to dollar, euro, whatever. Uh, uh, and you know, it's just a matter of size. Uh, and if enough people using Dai, it's maybe long-term even worthwhile to consider giving giving the usd pack up especially if you know whatever happens to us dollar uh, uh inflation etc uh, uh then kind of you know creating different uh packed stablecoin system in parallel so i'm a little bit uh, personally a little bit hesitant you know uh, even if i like the idea it would help us short term i think a lot for us as a protocol you know with all these European projects suffering a little bit because there's no euro nominated stablecoin on scale and just you know forget about all these euro stable coins actually if you look at the the size etc so uh that would help a lot but long term i'm actually not a big believer personally in, in, in fiat packed stable coins <laughs> Well, it's, uh, that's uh, fair enough. Um, I know the original plan for, for DAI was to be uh, linked to the so-called IMF SDR, which which was a, or is a basket of currencies, but that um, uh, that proved um, uh, because people are simply used to paying with US dollars and they're used to paying with euros and uh, so you have to go by what people want. Exactly. Uh, That's what I mean. You know, there's a growing ecosystem. It was a really exactly the right point, you know. Uh, and the DAI is not just considered as kind of, you know, a unit to transfer actually uh, value uh, on, on chain, but really used as a, as a payment medium. Uh, I think that could change, you know, especially. And that is, I, I think, where using real assets is a very important first step for also the maker ecosystem because hey you know we see that already the first borrowers actually asking for for being paid in die 
uh, for some reasons because hey they don't want to like uh, to get in US dollar they may need to you know transfer around the world just you know take die uh, have an, have a blockchain transaction to move from one wallet to the other or one address to the other and then exchange it basically already to a then you need it to a local currency they need it you know so uh, we see that already happening uh, and I think you know those that momentum that is something we will use. You know, I, I really believe DeFi should do more than just financing. It could also provide a uh, more decentralized payment system. And, and DAI is, I, I think, also the, the perfect uh, uh, you know, unit of accounting. And I'm not sure that it really needs to be long-term US dollar denominated. Okay. Um, if we could change the topic to growth, we all like growth. But uh, at Maker, we have a bit of a growth problem is that uh, we uh, are struggling to process all the collateral applications that we get. Now, uh, how is that over at Centrifuge? Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, please talk about so, the application onboarding process, what you do and how many you can process per month. Yeah, so... so um, like when we when we first started talking about real world assets in Maker, right? Die outstanding was like less than a billion, um, and like the amount of real world assets that like maybe you could put in was like significantly smaller, right? And since then, like so much stuff has happened, and that's been like, I mean, it's been like one and a half years, or maybe even less, right? So like, I think that's like one thing to keep in in uh, in perspective. Like this ecosystem is still like growing rapidly. And um, like problems we have today in Maker might, might not be the problems we have tomorrow in Maker. Um, we've definitely seen that, right? With like the die peg first being above and being under, like the DSR being crazy high, now the DSR being inexistent. But um, nevertheless, I think what, what we all want is growth, you're right. And I think we're, so if Semifuse is doing a few things, like we have started with very small asset originators and very small pools, specifically because we said we want to have low risk, um, like small pilots, right? Like we don't want to go to maker and ask for five hundred million dollars in in debt ceiling because, like that's that's just a risk that wouldn't make sense for like a first prototype. And so we've started with that, but like that's no obviously not where we want want to be um, because we all know that like if we start onboarding asset originators with five million dollars at a time in size, then um, we we're going to be nowhere near a billion um, and by anytime soon, right? Because there's obviously a lot of work. And so one, so if one of the, the things we're already doing and Fortunify is actually uh, the first pool that sort of falls into this category is actually where Fortunify is sort of creating a, a, a tin like pool of revenue-based finance assets. And they're already working with two different asset originators, um, uh, Coral and Pipe and are, are actually looking to add more and more. And so th this gives um, gives us much more scalability because now instead of having to create a new pool, uh, go through this entire process on the legal side, on the technical side, it's really just a, a an agreement between the investors in the pool and the, and the issuer, Fortunify in this case, to say, uh, we have this new asset originator that we'd like to start um, tokenizing assets from, and we'd like to add to this pool. Is everyone all right? This is how they. This is how they work. This is their risk profile, and uh, we'd like to onboard them. And this actually gives benefits for everybody involved, right? Because um, you you now um, diversify from the risk of like a single asset originator, because now you're investing in the same asset class but across different companies. Uh, it makes the pools bigger. Um, because there's obviously more than one asset originator you can add, and it speeds up, as I mentioned, the uh, the onboarding process for both Maker and um, and and us as well, but on technical, legal, and process. And so that's that's the thing I'm most um, excited about, um, and sort of how we change a bit how we will structure these pools. But then also um, another important part is like. One and a half years ago, no one believed that you could do real world assets in DeFi. I mean, like the 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 people that would like say, "Oh, like this will never happen," or oh, "This is so hard," right? Like it was extremely high, and it's something I think that we've managed to uh, change. I think the perception a bit with actually doing this first deployment with New Silver. I mean, the community, the greater 
right, the DeFi community picked this up hugely positively. And I think that's like, it's have been a big milestone. And so as we talk to asset originators, it's also an important milestone for them to see because, well, like no one wants to be the first one, right? So we're now like sort of in this stage where I think Maker, Sending Fusion, sort of DeFi as a whole can leapfrog from like, asset classes that are like 5 million size, like new silver today to going to like launching pools that are 20, 50 million dollars in size. So then like going into the hundreds of millions. And at that point, like we're still at a, at a size that is relatively small for the traditional finance world, right? Like a hundred million dollar uh, debt fund is actually small. Like a $500 million debt fund is like an okay size, but they easily go into the billions of dollars, right? So like, we're just starting to be like even visible on the map um, of some of these traditional players. And I'm actually, and that's sort of what Sunny Food is doing. And, and I mean, we should all be doing is to sort of start to continuously look at larger and larger asset originators as we are able to prove out the scale in both Maker and Centrifuge and sort of we we get more experience here. Um, maybe yeah. One, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, no worries. No, no maybe one point to add is. That of course, you know, hey, in the early days, uh, I think um, DeFi was working for crypto first. That makes total sense. Also, Maker was fully focusing on, on all these crypto assets. Uh, and for real world assets, uh, as we trying to onboard them, it was actually kind of you no know, uh, no real advantage. So if someone could go to a bank and get credit from a bank, why should they go to DeFi? It was uh, it's still most likely a more clunky process. It's not really cheaper. Uh, you get something that you then even you know, if you borrow in a stable coin, the US dollar is US dollar dominated. You don't get it in uh, fiat. But typically, you know, uh, businesses need to pay the invoice, etc. So there was a lot of actually hurdles uh, we had to overcome. And of course, you know, then finding actually this pass through, um, finding assets worthwhile to look at, worthwhile actually to find them kind of big enough really to start it. Uh, and then of course it was a couple of hundred thousand, one digit millions maybe. And then, you know, get uh, into uh, the process of convincing you guys to onboard those assets. That is a process, you know, and you can really see that momentum taking off uh, and uh, that those very first pools, these rather small pools we're talking about, you're already attracting other bigger players, you know, something I think a few of you were uh, in the call this monochill, um, last week, Friday, I think, so, hey, you know, those people, they wouldn't have been talked about to us something like 12 months ago, you know, the, uh, and that is, that will continue, you know, so that, uh, that, that pace, if you do it right, if you do it carefully, uh, will continue. Um, I think I've seen just in the chat another question, uh, and how, how do we pay our bills in five years? Uh, and the answer, I think, Alec, uh, gave, uh, the token model is exactly right, you know, even if we look at now parties like a, a Fortunify, uh, also, monitor to some extent, creating something like this new intermediary role of onboarding asset originators to to the to the centrifuge protocol and and, and spinning up pools and being an issuer. And um, that is something we can, I think, long term perfectly tokenize. Um, I think introduced the idea already a year ago um, as as our underwriter token that will come soon. Where actually, if you kind of you know being able. To create token economics around how to originate assets, to underwrite assets, uh, that makes also the entire process much slicker and, and scaling it up and uh, actually kind of, you know, is reducing the trust you need actually to have as someone uh, providing liquidity to a single asset originator or to a single borrower because you're just being protected by uh, on top token economics where uh, the risk is shared with other token holders, kind of, you know, investing in the underwriter token, for example, et cetera. Like you're already. Uh, kind of protected by the tranching we're doing right now. You know, the, the one <laughs> so far and first and only step we did so far, we of course want to continue. When it comes to decentralization, it's just decentralizing the entire asset management. Uh, I think that is, is already kind of revolutionary, but it's uh, rather simple, you know, uh, in the process. And I think we're looking forward to just uh, decentralize more and more parts of these traditional financing processes. All right, yeah. Um... Uh, okay, maybe I should stop talking before I monopolize the thing. Um, I will turn this over to you, Jerry. Right? Did you have a question you want to ask? Um, yeah, sure. So um, I, I guess, I mean, on the topic of growth, I'm just curious 
like what um, I'm still kind of familiarizing myself with the forums and I mean, some of the, the real world assets that are being onboarded. Uh, I mean, I just think it's really exciting stuff. Um, you know, and of course, these are decentralized systems. I, I don't have a, like a whole lot of visibility into kind of how, how Centrifuge operates, but um, I've been learning more about that. Um, just, just like what maybe um, the, you would recommend the community to, to do to, to kind of help drive growth. Um, like I've, I've, uh, you know, like one idea I had is if, if somehow there was like a development fund that could get, um, set up and funded in, in, you know, uh, a joint development fund between maker and centrifuge, for example. Um, or, um, I mean, I'm still looking around at kind of documentation and all that, but if there's some sort of like blueprint out there that, that we could kind of open source to the, the community, um, you know, it sounds like one of the main bottlenecks is, uh, identifying asset uh, originators that that we could onboard um, to the platform. So, so anyway, that that's kind of a, a an open ended question. But um, if there's any, if you could talk about any of the bottlenecks to growth and and kind of any of the ideas um, you have to just recommend to to community members to to help uh, drive adoption and, and growth in real world assets. I can try to address it, but I'm, it's an open-ended question. Really. Most of you know I can can share ideas here, but uh, do I really have an answer? Most likely not. So, um, yeah, I think look as you mentioned already. You know, so we think we would like to build an ecosystem. We are first, I think, you know, uh, users in the ecosystem play different roles in helping us scale. Like you know, um, issuers onboarding asset originators uh, and growing pools, uh, like you know, the Fortuna Fies. Uh, the 7054s, fours, et cetera. Um, then uh, that is, that's one idea and token economics is the next one. I really, I really like the idea of the grant. Uh, um, so we will, will go forward here. Um, I'm not sure if that makes sense really to combine things. Of course, we are completely open. Anyway, everything what we're doing is permissionless, open, open source. So, you know, all our code is open source. Uh, you can find on GitHub. Uh, everyone can use it. We are not even a gatekeeper. It's just, you know, if you're, uh, would like to uh, spin up a pool uh, and uh, kind of, you know, uh, talk with Centrifuge as a team uh, and, and ask us for support. It's just your decision, but basically everyone can do that, you know, and if it comes back to stable coins, hey, the protocol is open. Uh, and if uh, someone wants to spin up a pool, uh, it's just deploying the smart contracts on its own and then deciding that another ESC20 token should be used to fund it. Hey, you know, so what? It's an, it's an open permissionless network and everyone can do that. Um, so, uh, of course, you know, we would like to build here something which is, which is inviting, uh, and, and welcoming and, uh, uh, is, uh, is creating something where, uh, all these different Lego blocks can actually interact and, and, and build something which wasn't there before. Yeah, I think maybe I can just add a little bit on that. Um, I think overall, like Miku does already a really good job of documenting things, which maybe we can learn a bit from. Um, so. Overall, I think there are already good efforts there. Um, what we experience, but that also is changing. Um, Astro originators become more and more um, sophisticated in in that space. But like, um, there is some like work to do with like helping them also working with the DAO. I mean, that was completely new to us. That is completely new for uh, some of the asset originators, and. Um, I think one like that on one side, making that whole process a little bit more digestible. Um, and then also um, maybe actually Seb and Will can also speak a little bit to that, like from the make perspective, just like also helping the MKR holders, like the maker community um, grasp, or like understand, um, those collateral applications a little bit um, better or like make it easier to digest. Um, Seb and that was, I guess, like what the Real World Asset Committee also started out, um, like how that was founded. Um, I guess overall, like they're building out that process and increasing transparency and like I've said digestible now five times, but I think that's the key um, to help everyone to streamline the process and like make it easier to navigate. 
Yeah, sure. I, I don't know whether you guys can you hear me okay? I I may have a bit of background noise. Um. Yeah. We 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 of course like we started in the same. I guess with the same kind of overarching goals as as uh, like in Lake and uh, Hughes with that. Um. You know. Let's let's try to get something started and um and let's refine as we go. And I think. I think we've been we've been learning a lot from from the from, from that process ourselves. So, although my kind of in the in the early days in the early days of it, uh, even I, I'd say like to an extent, tried to um, reapply some relatively formal uh, formal processes for onboarding, and even kind of being a little bit over. Over detailed on some some of that. I remember, like first uh, first catch up with the guys from, for example, like a bunch of uh, and so on, and and I felt like next fair is like sending them like a, a list of a hundred data fields that I needed them actually to provide by uh, by soon, and and if I, and then realizing that well maybe you know. Um, the operator is not in the not in the stage of maturity where they can already be in that stage and was their side. So I guess like I I've, I've learned a lot from that process. Just for me saying like okay, um I'm not, you know, coming from from originally from a banking background, but like okay, I'm not dealing with the same kind of project where you to do banking because it's just a, a different in the different stage of maturity that are, they are in, but eventually we're gonna get there. And as we started, you know, going through that and learning from that, we started kind of like also, I guess, adapting our own processes internally to say, okay, we got to to create some frameworks for for onboarding these um, for onboarding these reward assets and adapt to the stage of maturity and um, and I guess exigence that you need to to have from where they are, but that also comes with the caveat, I think, from the major side to say, okay, if they're not mature enough at some stage, in particular, for example, for the fund, for the gas originated, let's work with them along that journey and let's try the process as we work, but we're not going to go and say straight away, say, you can already fail to uh, 15 million, 20 million. Fifty million dollars because you're not at the stage of maturity. Because if you were at the stage of maturity, like some of those requirements that we provided in the first fair would be like no brainer, and it would be straight there like, for you. So that's kind of I think there's a lot of adaptation and a lot of like learning on our side. And I think as Luke was, was mentioning earlier, for example, we see quite a bit of uh, between the different asset originators that we are dealing with. Uh, for some of I have been one of them where they already have, you know, the, uh, the partners on the services side of the platform that are already originating quite a bit and they have that process that is, you know, quite data driven and all that. So it's quite, it's, I guess, easier to get some of the information from, from them to scale, uh, for example, comparing to other asset originators. And that might be also like just a matter of like, Asset classes, right? You know, you know that there are some asset classes in the in the pool that are um, that are a little bit more traditional, like you know, say financial things like this and accountable, but they tend to be a little bit more traditional comparing to uh, say um, some that are going after uh, what we say financing right now because it's just like it's a relatively new industry, so. In the new industry, it's already stuck from a point where it builds its platform on a more modern, um, more modern framework. So, so you can actually be a little bit more, you know, demanding um, in terms of the, the framework that you have to that. But, anyways, I mean, I guess long story short, we we're, we're really learning and hiding the framework around all of this stuff along along the way. And I think now things are gonna probably start becoming more and more I guess consistent comparing to the early stages because we are starting to see um from, from centrifuge side um more I 
guess, mature um, as the fun that are coming um, and presenting to us. You know, for example, some of the ones is like the WinTech, you know, uh, that had a call with the community a few weeks back. Uh, there's Monochill and there's a few others. So we're starting to see that maturity at as it says, so to look at the point, it's, um, yeah, it, it's really, it's really a, a matter of stage. You cannot go after the 500 million, you know, uh, RBMS, um, RMBS funds from day one, and then put 500 million, uh, you know, warehousing structures into the native protocol uh, without actually bringing out, so I guess, the community alongside with that. You would have, actually, those funds are out there for that, but it's just, not in the stage I think where uh, where we are right now because um, you cannot move I guess too fast and then and then and then actually go back and have to explain to the whole community that in all of a sudden you have I don't know and fifteen percent of them all make up for the fall into one warehouse that's pretty so um, we kind of we we have to play a, a role where we bring the community on and with us in the in the chain. Brett, did you have another question or? Uh, you, you mean me? No, sorry. Um, I, I mean, I guess maybe just um, shifting gears a little bit. I, I know Centrifuge is um, starting to work with uh, Akala on the Polkadot network. Um, is there any, and this might be a little bit technical, technically naive of a question, but um, is there anything that Maker can do or do you anticipate working with Maker um, through the Polkadot ecosystem somehow, or or is that kind of a separate growth avenue for Centrifuge? Yeah, that's a question. Yeah. Yeah. First. Um, so, so, we're, so maybe to talk a bit about the architecture for those that are not super familiar with it. Um, so we're like Tin Lake is today a set of smart contracts on Ethereum that sort of manage the different loans, manage the tokens that are used both as collateral in Maker, but also are held by different investors. Um, the part that is that we see sort of in the long run moving to to Polkadot and to um, sort of our dedicated chain is um, the piece that is actually the infrastructure that's used by the asset originators to underwrite. The, diff the individual loans, right? For us, um, for us, the the challenge is not just to work with you guys and other DeFi protocols to like assess the risk of of these pools overall, but also for the asset originators to like get some idea of how much they should pay in interest, what the risk should be of these different individual loans, right? Like. Uh, for example, in New Silver, there are now over thirty different properties in there that all need to be actually underwritten and priced, and um, and so that's that's sort of the part that's happening on um, on on Centrifuge Chain in in the future, and that's where sort of how we think of the architecture as well, right? Like the asset originators use Centrifuge Chain to uh, create these pools, and then the the assets, the collateral, can move either to a maker or to other uh, lending protocols, other chains, wherever uh, this may end up. Um, so that's that's a bit of the, the the strategy in the future. I think I'm for now, like it's very early, right? Polkadot's not live yet, and our our focus is um, sort of to keep building what we have on Ethereum um, and and scale that as we sort of work on on uh, Polkadot in the future. And honestly, I I see the maker role as. I don't know, the central bank of DeFi. Uh, and uh, of course, there will be more other also decentralized liquidity providers. There will be more sophisticated, I think, securitization structures in the future we also would like to provide uh, than, you know, building it on our chain, which is just, you know, cheaper to use if it comes to computation, securing smart contracts, et cetera. Um, and uh, still being secure and being protected then by, by adult as an ecosystem, at least for, for this part of, uh, managing those those underlying assets and um, not not investing in the pool or uh, uh, pricing the, the tokens using as collateral for, for example um so pretty much like i think you know they are also i think everyone else is, is looking around how actually even if DeFi is embedded in ethereum uh, side chains or scaling solutions actually around ethereum could be used to kind of you know 
at least kind of transfer gas intense uh, costly parts which need less security uh, to side chains or um, something like pocket of for example and that's exactly what they're doing like you know with, with makers considering this optimize etc so um, and uh, I think the core value transfer uh, there in most of the theory will still happen on, on Ethereum. Uh, and I think, you know, if uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not wrong here, um, the, the decentral bank, the backbone, uh, I see maker in that role. You know, there is, as you look at the traditional finance world, a lot of banks out there, but only a few central banks. And uh, DeFi is a single system. I think uh, economy, ecosystem, whatever you want to call it, doesn't need more than a single central bank. Uh, uh, that's it, I think. Uh, and around that, there will be a, a multitude in the multiverse of different financing options. And that is okay, you know, for the differences, risks, assessments, crunches, et cetera. Um, you know, you don't, do not want to finance everything, I guess. That is completely okay. Awesome. So also in terms of looking towards the future, is the fo the plan to focus more on retail access to capital or more so on SMEs and or corporate funding perhaps? Uh, on on the borrowing side, I think our focus is really on commercial uh, credit. You know, so uh, maybe think uh, before you know most likely things like you know retail retail consumer loans etc being fully tokenized and decentralized that will it's, it's most of the complex and I'm pretty sure that will be a different protocol that will be not not be not be centrifuge. You know, maybe then they tap into centrifuge to securitize those assets and then it maybe is finally ending up uh, also in, in a maker world, all possible and I would like it, but that is not uh, what we what we actually look at. You know, so we would like to uh, kind of most likely start this commercial credit first. Uh, if that is working, I think it can be used for uh, a much broader decentralized credit system, and that is okay. Um, uh, but uh, again, focus is most likely on commercial credit, and then it doesn't matter the size of the business. Uh, what we would like to make sure that the system is working equally good for a small business as well as a big business, and that the small fish tax, a small business paying today, either no credit at all or for a much higher price because you know the banks aren't able to process it and help them, that that is, is going away and we can, can you know, solve that issue. Uh, and long term, uh, I think what we believe in as well, and that's why I'm also kind of focusing um, more on supply chain uh, rather than real estate, honestly, is, is really that we believe uh, how things are produced and financed today is very ineffective. You know, so the idea of DJ financing um, that is still somewhere in our heads and we are still uh, you know, thrilled by that, uh, where we believe long term, I think uh, it doesn't make sense. If you, you know, we have this nice example is, I think, sneakers. Uh, if you have the cotton and then the shoelaces and then the sneakers, but actually what's on the sneakers finally got financed three times, you know, so financing the cotton, uh, the fabric production, the shoe shoelaces, and then the sneakers themselves, it just doesn't make sense, you know, uh, I'll say the only one who gets richer is, is today is, is, is the banks, not just uh, because of, uh, you know, kind of, you know, the, the, the interest they charge, but also that they actually charge it a few times on actually the, the same sneakers, you know. Makes sense. Um, I, we are at the top of the hour, so I would like to give anybody in the audience who might have more questions or a question an opportunity to jump in if they haven't already. Or Brett, if you have another question as well. I see Will is asking in the chat if we were to consider Tin Lake as a platform, what would be the applications of such a platform for real world assets? Thinking of traditional aspects of securitization like legal architectures, servicer nodes, liquidation nodes, et cetera. Lucas, maybe you would like to address that uh, or at least give a first, first glimpse on. I, I didn't catch the entire question. I'm sorry. Like the, is, is this what Will, Will, Will you were asking in the chat, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so I think Tin Lake is like a, it is a, it is a, like at the very core securitization framework, right? Because actually, when you think of like the interesting real world collateral uh, that we want one in DeFi is one that has yield that is sort of wants the liquidity that exists in in. Uh, in in DeFi, and as that oftentimes it's stuff like houses, business revenue, uh, farmland, right? You name it, and those all of these things are different non fungible 
unique uh, properties or or assets. And so um, what what we do is we securitize them, we bundle them, and we allow people to get sort of exposure over a broad portfolio. And that allows us to actually, um, you, you you now have the ability to just buy part of the part of farmland, not having to pick one farm that you like, and then make one is the one on sale and then find and when you want to sell it you need to actually find another buyer who wants to buy exactly that farm right so that's what you get the securitization so in a way it's solving the scalability problem that DeFi has where like as soon as it's something that's hard to price or like very illiquid uh we can't we don't know how to work with it in DeFi. and so um so as we do this right uh the securitization we bring in um a legal a legal structure that allows actually to not just have this information be on chain and these tokens to flow around, but also ensure that uh, when you actually buy these tokens um, or when we put them in a maker vault, that you uh, that you know you're going to get some die back for them when you want to redeem them. Um, and so there's this this um, there's this set of like services and infrastructure that is going to be this is built around this. Um, that in this in a very similar way to what the traditional fin financial system um, has today with servicers uh, as will mentioned that sort of take over in case there's something wrong with an asset and try to liquidate it or like try to sort of make sure that nothing goes that it's it managed according to plan um there's um underwriting and sort of the junior tranche that's that's sort of a way to ensure and reduce credit the risk for the senior investors right so those are now the the components that come on top yeah i think it's a it's a platform which um i hope you know we um can can open up and make it more flexible um uh long term um and you mentioned legal lucas uh, that is important that's something that we need to take care of kind of being following the rules uh, because all these businesses asking for credit here um, they you know are embedded in the real world uh, embedded in the traditional legal system they don't live in the crypto bubble unfortunately and that's uh, where we need to comply and to take care of uh, but nevertheless you know we, we think uh, also uh, you know opening up the tradability for for the drug tokens that we use as a collateral would help you know so there's uh, one of those uh, steps also we would like to focus on rather short term. Um, uh, where it's not, you know, currently you need to give the, the drop tokens basically back to the issuer, back to the to the, to the pool, uh, and uh, liquidate it this way, which is not perfect. But as soon as you have a secondary market, you could basically liquidate them as other crypto tokens. Most likely not with the same liquidity, but at least much faster than than you could do that today. You know, so so things, for example. Okay, I do want to offer one more time if anybody else has any further questions. Otherwise, if y'all have any specific wrap ups you'd like to give, or there's any conclusions you wanted to finish off with. Any exciting news coming up? Like myself, I'm a big sports fan. You got any uh, RWA sports coming through via Centrifuge? That'd be super cool. I'm not sure if you could talk about that, but. Maybe Leah, uh, if you would like to mention something. So, uh, of course, we we'll be looking at whatever NFT uh, an NFT is representing, and it's not a big deal to kind of you know finance or put put crypto uh, digital art NFTs uh, into a pool or uh, other collectibles. Mm, not yeah, I'm not entirely sure what to share on the collectible sorry. Um, but I think what I'm really excited about is um, I don't know if this is newsworthy enough, but like um, I'm really excited that we have um, what Lucas mentioned that we're like diverging into this or like more well, moving on to this um, onboarding, like Fortuna Fi does like with um, more of like a fund structure where they are able to just like scale a lot faster a lot easier that of course is exciting um and overall like making that i'm like the process nurse so i'm like happy to like make the process more streamlined etc so um maybe more than you add a little bit more on, on yeah, i can just continue you know yeah. I mean, especially do i think the nft hype you've been through uh, a couple of uh, rather weeks ago, I guess, uh, um, 
we are excited about this use case as well, of course. Uh, I'm not sure it really makes sense, you know, to start with those growth first uh, ideas and approaching you guys. Uh, I got, at, at least I believe that, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Frank would like to give you an opinion here that is most likely the wrong collateral for the time being, looking at Maker. Uh, that is most likely more, you know, experimental uh, because, hey, losing here all your money is much more likely than financing. You know, uh, properties is new silver or invoices. This I don't know how the fake credit is like that. <laughs> I mean, one one really cool pool that launched recently is Branch, which is um, which is the, uh, the emerging markets, um, which is going into emerging markets, right? And I think that's that's like super cool because it's obviously also a very big part of Maker. I think there's a big big community in South America that's using DAI just sort of to escape inflation. Um, I think um, sort of by actually extending credit to um, to fintechs that focus on sort of providing better access to finance in, in, in these countries, right? Now we're not just actually using DAI as a store of value, but also we can use DAI as a way to borrow money. Um, and I think that's, that's really cool uh, branch. Uh, launched a few weeks ago, I think two weeks ago, and they're now, um, I think, at four million die. Um, I don't know if they have a MIP six application already out, but they're definitely excited to work with uh, Maker as well in the long term. Um, yeah. We just get started to give them the first wrap up of how the DAO works. <laughs> cool. But yeah, overall, I think um, we haven't touched upon the topic so much and it has come up in like um, private messages before that like some people also had questions on how um, more around the mechanics of Tim, like how it works, like how how it works from an investor perspective, from a borrower perspective, what is an epoch, et cetera. So um, if there's more questions on that side, I think we're also happy to like have another session that maybe focuses a bit more on smart contracts, um, just as an offer, um, if if there's interest. I think there is, and I believe we should plan that. I, we haven't scheduled that yet, but we should do another call and dive a little more into that. Yeah, Frank's excited about it, yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah, on that note, Thank you all so much for this and look out for the next one for sure. We'll be diving a little more into the development side. And I appreciate all of your time. Thank you so much for coming today. This was wonderful. And thank everybody else for coming as well and all your questions. Yeah, yeah, thank thanks. you. And thanks for organizing. Yeah. Okay, have a good one.